Awesome. All right. So uh, welcome, everyone. Um, so we're here. Let's get started. Um, um, so let me go. So just a quick about me as like a human being. Um, so I uh, got my BA from Wellesley College in 2018. Uh, I wrote my honors thesis on suburban horror and suburban uncanniness. Uh, I got my master's degree like a, about a year, uh, about a year ago, year and a half ago. Um, modern contemporary literary studies, writing about uh, gender and sexuality in 1980s uh, anglophone body horror. Um, that's me over here at my uh, job. I lived in Boston for quite some time. I was born there. Um, I lived there until I was eight. I went back for college to study at Wellesley. I stayed for three more years afterwards. Um, that's me at my ghost tour job. Um, I gave ghost tours and that was my full-time job for like three years. Um, but it was an acting job. So they had us all dress up and it was fun. I made a lot of kids cry, not on purpose, but I did. Um, so this is kind of a compilation of my knowledge, not just as someone who works in kind of like New England history, but as someone who lived there, who considers, um, I consider myself a New Englander, um, I have a lot of info on like gothic and, and weird fiction. So it all kind of like, you know, it all melds together, which is why I've got so many slides and so many thoughts. Um, I actually currently live in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, so that's um, Southeast United States. New England is Northeast United States, which we're going to get into in a bit. Um, the reason that I bring this up is because those are two really, really different regions of the United States. If you're not an American, um, What's I think really interesting about America is that like different regions of the country are almost like different countries, um, but they still have kind of like a lot of that same American uh, cultural mythology and seeing the ways that manifests like firsthand in different parts of the country, I think really clarifies a lot of what I understand about New England. Um, so basically, this is the order that we're going to be talking about things. We're going to talk about history. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, folklore. Um, especially folklore as it relates to certain parts of history. And then we're going to be talking about some of New England's writers and how they kind of reflect those earlier themes that we find in folklore and history. So, of course, part one, history and culture. So here is just a kind of a map of the United States and New England as it relates to the rest of the country. So up here, um, it is six states, Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, up in the Northeast corner. Um, so this is one of the earliest places uh, colonized by Europe. A lot of these uh, uh, states have really similar, uh, really uh, connected relationships to each other. For example, Maine was part of Massachusetts. Rhode Island was founded by offshoots from people in Massachusetts. Um, so they all have their own kind of independent thing, but they all share a lot of similarities. I'm also going to be talking a lot about Massachusetts and Boston in particular. Um, this is for a couple of reasons. The first one is obviously that I lived there uh, and worked there. So I, I do know more about that inherently. But also Boston is the capital of Massachusetts and by extension is kind of the unofficial capital of New England. So a lot of things from New England do kind of radiate out from that Boston area. So we're going to start pre-colonial. Um, so... I, I find what's very interesting as someone who has lived in, in Europe as well as America is that, you know, sometimes Americans are like, everything in Europe is so old. And sometimes Europeans are like, everything in America is so young. Um, but the truth is that um, there have been people living in what's going to become the United States for, for thousands of years before um, being colonized by Europe. Um, below uh, just a kind of list of some of the indigenous tribes that live and continue to live in the New England area. Um, they have a lot of like rich cultural heritage. They have um, a lot of presence today. Um, I bring that up, one, to clarify that there's still a very strong indigenous culture, um, but also because a lot of these names, some of these names of these tribes are going to come up in the fiction we're going to talk about, um, written by people who do not belong to these tribes. Um, so keep these in mind. Um, and here's just um, some information. So... This is from the Narragansett tribal website, uh, the Moshpee Wampanoag tribe government website. Um, so they still have governments. Um, they still have programming. Um, they still do a lot of stuff. Um, and I would encourage you to look into some of the things they've created and done. Um, it's really, really great. And also, I think, really, really important to, uh, to highlight and understand. Um, but when it comes to how America came to be, right, or New England, how New England came to be, the first Europeans arrive in what's going to be New England in the early 17th century. They trade with indigenous tribes. They also 
bring diseases that kill a lot of the indigenous people. Um, there are patterns of violence, dispossession, forced assimilation, mass murder. Um, two that come to mind in particular are the Pequot War, um, which killed a lot of Pequot people. And King Philip, as he was known to the English speakers, uh, Chief Medicom, uh, as he was known uh, to the Wampanoag people, of which he was one, um, which was kind of the last stand of a lot of the indigenous people in the area. Uh, around 3,000 Wampanoag people are killed or forced into slavery because of uh, King Philip's war, um, including uh, Chief Medicom himself. Um, so let's keep that in mind. But we're going to talk about the first uh, really Europeans who come to the New England area. Um, and they, these are called the Puritans. Um, so there are kind of two groups of Puritans. There's like the original, they called themselves the Pilgrims, and they settled in Plymouth. And then larger, another group of Puritans um, who found Mass Bay Colony um, around Boston. Um, so this is kind of, these people are very much the foundation of New English, of, of New England Anglophone culture. Um, so you're going to see a couple of, you're going to see a lot of their names come up again. So for example, over here, we've got The Day of Doom, uh, written by a guy named Michael Wigglesworth in 1662. Um, and it's basically a kind of treatise on all the ways that um, people are going to get punished and killed by God. Um, they think that they're righteous enough, but they're not. They're not as righteous as him, not as righteous as the Puritans, right? Um, and it's it's an absolute blast to read. It is wild. Um, but keep that name Wigglesworth in mind. It's going to come back. Um, this is a guy named John Winthrop. Now, he was the first governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, um, which was what's going to become Massachusetts and a lot of other New England states. Um, and he's talking here about um, we're going to be a city on a hill. He's talking about Boston. The eyes of all people are upon us. Um, the idea is that Boston is going to be the most righteous, the most uh, pure. Um, they were actually, they were called the Puritans because they were kind of offshoots of not, I should clarify. Um, they believed the Church of England had not gone far enough in purifying from the Catholic Church. So they were going to purify it even further. Um, so he has the idea of essentially creating like a Puritan paradise but I also hesitate to say paradise because Puritans uh, are not pro-fun in like any way um so you're gonna see some of their beliefs in a moment um I would also love to bring John Winthrop back in like a time machine and show him what Boston's like today um would love to see some you know college students you know puking outside of bars he'd have a great time um but this is what they had in mind when they were creating New England so here's some of the Puritan beliefs um they were really, really fun. They had a good time. So they believed that everyone was born of sin. They were offshoots of the Calvinists. And Calvinism believes inherently in the idea of predestination. So predestination is the idea that God has chosen who is saved, who is one of the elect, and who is damned before you're even born. Um, there is literally nothing you independently can do about it. And I remember the first time that I read about predestination and Calvinist theology, I was like, well, that doesn't make any sense to me because everything I've ever read about the Puritans shows that they were like super, super obsessed with like always behaving the most godly, always being the most righteous. And I found, because if, if I knew that I didn't have a choice, um, I'd be like, well, got to live while you can. But um, the Puritan church um, believed in a thing called a conversion narrative and sanctification. Basically, you can't actually join the Puritan church itself um, unless you prove that you are one of the elect. And how do you prove that you are one of the elect? You show um, that you have the sanctification, this proof of salvation. And this proof of your, of your sanctification um, comes in the way that you behave and the way you act and the way you think, which means that Puritans are constantly self-analyzing and self-criticizing trying to prove to themselves that they are indeed one of God's elect. Um, there are two covenants that come in big in Puritan uh, theology. There's the covenant of works, which was the original one that God made with Adam that he broke by eating the apple, uh, not the apple, the fruit. It's just a fruit in the actual Bible. Um, and then there's the covenant of grace, which is what replace it, replaces it, which is kind of God's new relationship with the elect, the elect receive grace. Um, so as you can imagine, it's a really, really anxiety inducing way to live. Um, if you believe 100% that there is a hell and there is a heaven and you have to be a special kind of person to not go to hell and to go to heaven, um, you're constantly trying to prove to yourself that, yes, no, I am one of the elect. I am one of God's best people. I am doing the work that 
has been set out before me. Um, so right here, you see a little uh, screenshot from the movie The Witch. I believe that's Robert Eggers, um, um, which is pretty uh, accurate to a lot of the kind of like uh, ways that Puritans thought and the kind of anxiety, the constant state of anxiety that they lived in. Now, Puritans, they live, they, they, but their descendants, um, a lot of them be, uh, become this kind of new American aristocracy. So America doesn't have an aristocracy the same way that a lot of European countries do. Um, but the closest thing that we do have are these Boston Brahmins, uh, named so for the uh, Hindu caste, the highest one. Um, these are basically um, New England's old money. They're old good, respectable families. A lot of them descendants being, or a lot of them are descendants of these Puritans. Um, they've got families like the Adams, the Cabots, the Lowell's, the Parkmans, Peabody, Putnam, Quincy, Wigglesworth, Winthrop. You may remember Wigglesworth and Winthrop. They, we already talked about them in Puritan times. So their like great grandchildren, great, great grandchildren ended up belonging, ended up like essentially being the heads of these American dynasties. Um, and they have a lot of power and a lot of influence and very, very high social standing. Um, and their influence in New England um, is really going to become clear in some of the folklore, some of the fiction, um, but also keeping in mind that they are related from these earlier uh, Puritans really shows us a lot. We'll get into it. Um, below, right here, you see there's a poem by a guy named John Collins Bro uh, Bossidy, kind of making fun of how in Boston there are these rich old fancy families who only talk to each other. I was actually in a play like in January um, where I played someone who was in a Brahmin family and uh, they seemed like they were deeply miserable people. <laughs> but just for context of how powerful and how influential the Brahmins are, uh, these are some screenshots that I've taken from some Wikipedia pages of these Brahmin families. Um, so many of these names are in blue, right? Um, and those are just the ones whose families don't have their own Wikipedia pages already. Um, so the kid, the son's influential and the grandson and the great, great grandson, and they shape the history and they shape the culture and they're going to do a lot. We'll see. Um, also we have the kind of New England nouveau riche. Um, so these are some mansions in Newport, Rhode Island. Um, these were the summer cottages of a lot of the Gilded Age Nouveau Riche. So that's 19th century um, people who get very, very wealthy around this time. And they have their enormous mansions. Um, again, I just cannot believe they're called cottages. That is so bleak. I'm literally screaming to you from a closet right now. Um, but um, so again, like another kind of element of this, of this aristocratic kind of uh, social class of people. We're also, we also talk about the Ivies or the Ivy League colleges. So the Ivy League was actually originally founded as a football league um, or American football league, um, but these are now synonymous with being the top schools in America, some of them the top schools in the world. Um, some of these have little asterisks by them. No, those are ones that are in New England. There are eight Ivies. Half of them are literally in this one region of the country. Um, they're also some of the oldest colleges. So Harvard is actually America's oldest college. Um, Yale, uh, Brown, Dartmouth, a lot of U.S. presidents have been here, a lot of very influential um, U.S. policymakers, a lot of very influential like U.S. public figures, um, a lot of whom also like, did belong to these Brahmin families or did belong to this aristocracy. A lot of, um, it's very hard to get into places like Harvard or Yale, but there are definitely a good chunk of people who are there purely as legacy admissions because their grandfather and their great-grandfather great and their great-great-grandfather went there. And then also that family donates a whole lot of money to their enormous endowments. Um, so it's class, uh, it's a way of preserving class um, through the idea of education. Um, Amer New England's also really important for the cultural mythology of the American Revolution. Um, so the American Revolution, I can tell you, like specifically as an American um, who was raised learning about it, um, has like this really mythic, like almost like an apotheosis of like the people who who made it happen. Um, so essentially, this was when the United States broke away from uh, the British Empire. And I remember being taught about it so seriously, all these ideas of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And it wasn't until I was like nine or 10 years old that I realized that like we were actually allies with the British, like right now. Um, I was like, oh, I guess we hate them, right? 
Um, but New England's very, very active during the American Revolution. A lot of prominent New Englanders um, were members of a group called the Sons of Liberty, which is one of the big revolutionary groups, uh, and or they signed the Declaration of Independence, which is what they used to declare themselves independent. Um, we got John, Ant John Adams, Samuel Adams, John Hancock, Ben Franklin, Paul Revere, Samuel Huntington, Stephen Hopkins. Uh, if you're an American, uh, you know a lot of these names. Um, I also think it's really interesting in terms of New England's participation in the Revolutionary War. It's taught a lot, of course, about being about like life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, freedom, the ability to do what you want. But America for like a hundred years later still had like slave, uh, enslaved labor. So did a lot of the uh, actual American revolutionaries. George Washington, the first president of the United States, had people who were enslaved. And so did a lot of other early presidents. I There's a place in Boston called Faneuil Hall. Um, it's by it's like kind of it's a shopping touristy area by the uh, by the waterfront. Um, but at the top of Faneuil Hall, there is a meeting room where a bunch of these revolutionaries would meet and they would talk about, you know, their plans for liberty. Um, in fact, Faneuil Hall is called the Cradle of Liberty. And I think that's really, really ironic um, because it's named after a guy named Peter Faneuil, um, who is very active in the slave trade. And in fact, Faneuil Hall was a site of um, of it's selling people, selling enslaved people. So you have already this like really inherent tension between the idea of the United States uh, and of New England and of the reality of New England. Um, so here's what we basically have for like, what's like New England culture like? Now, obviously there's no one culture for any particular area. So this is just one slice of it. Um, but a lot of the stuff that we're going to be talking about kind of relates to this particular kind of cultural subset. So we have a deep rooting in American history, more so than other regions of the country, which I say as someone who lived in both uh, Boston and Atlanta right now, you walk around in Atlanta, this entire city, the entire city of Atlanta was burned down in like 1864 during the American Civil War. So you really don't have anything older than mid 19th century. Whereas in Boston, you walk like a couple feet and there's like another old Puritan burial ground from the 17th century, um, which is some of like the oldest colonial stuff that we have in the country. Um, so we have the existence of history being very, very present. Um, a lot of these old families that were some of the first uh, people of European, the first Europeans and people of European descent, having a lot of pride in being some of the first and in their influence on the region. There is this tendency towards the aristocratic, the idea of East Coast money, um, so, for example, off of uh, the Cape of Massachusetts, um, there's an island called Martha's Vineyard, um, which is where a lot of former presidents spend their summers. Um, it's where Fox Mulder from the X-Files grew up. Um, but there's, of course, like a lot of, of course, controversy and stuff around that. There was a former uh, U.S. senator, I believe Ted Kennedy, who was one of the Kennedys. But actually, um, he killed a woman in a drunk driving accident in Martha's Vineyard. Um, so that went, ruined his ability to run for president. Um, and really was something he was never able to move past. Um, but we also have the idea of education, both the idea of being educated and being educated at the right school as social capital. So it's like, oh, I went to Harvard and I have all my connections from Harvard, or I went to Yale and I have all my connections there and we're all Harvard people and we're all Yale people and we all belong to these old families and we all live in these uh, beautiful little houses and we are all have things in our family that we are very, very, very ashamed of. Um, so on the right, you're going to see, I have some gifts from a web series called Gale by a guy named Chris Fleming. Um, it's spelled G-A-Y-L-E. The reason that I have them and the reason that I mention it is because I could not possibly explain New England culture to you better than you going and watching this web series. It really shows the kind of passive aggressive elitism um, that a lot of the people and the absolute terror over, you know, their reputations that a lot of prominent New Englanders have and feel. So that's kind of our historical grounding. And now I'm going to drink a bit of water. So we're going to talk about some of the folklore that um, comes out of that historic grounding, um, but also some of the historical events that kind of joined um, the New England folklore in the future. So Boston Brahmins, old, rich, powerful. Obviously, there are some skeletons in the closet, right? Um, so a lot of Brahmins have done uh, some really messed up things. Um, but a very famous, uh, there's a murder trial, um, mid 19th century, um, of a guy named Dr. George Parkman, um, who was a very prominent, well-respected Brahmin who was possibly murdered by a guy named John Webster, who was a, a chemistry professor at Harvard university. 
um, he owed Parkman a lot of money. Um, the story goes that um, when Parkman came to collect, uh, he killed him and chopped him all up and put him down his toilet. Um, and there was a, a janitor named Ephraim Littlefield at Harvard who actually found um, Parkman's remains. It was like the trial of the century. There's a lot of question as to whether or not uh, Webster did what he did. Um, a lot of Brahmins um, were very torn because it was essentially one of their own, you know, killing another one. Um, so there's like this great question of like, oh, like, was was he did he was he given a fair trial? Was um was this attempt of like assassination of his like um reputation assassination? Um, a lot of them very a lot of the Brahmins strongly believed that Littlefield, the one who found the remains and may have actually been the real murderer and killed um killed Parkman and framed Webster. Um, so oh. there's a certain degree of like, oh, you know, we protect ourselves or we're protecting other Brahmins. Um, this was also a really important uh, uh case in forensic um history though, because this is one of the first times like forensic evidence for like bones and human remains was used in the United States. Um so this is just like one example, um, but I bring it up because you see like the name Parkman and Webster kind of all over Boston. Um, and Webster is buried in an unmarked grave in Copps Hill Burying Ground, which is in Boston's North End, um, so that like no one would come and like desecrate his grave. Um, but a lot of people don't know that. Also worth noting, um, some of the ways that a lot of these powerful institutions have um, been responsible for some other, I mean, a lot of messed up things, obviously. Like, there's no Ivy League that doesn't have things that they should absolutely be ashamed of. Um, but the founders of Harvard Medical School, a lot of whom were revolutionaries, um, um, they had something called the Spunker Club. Um, the Spunker Club was a grave robbing society. Um, so back in the 18th century, a lot of people did not want to donate their bodies to science, or a lot of the bodies that were donated to science were people who were convicted of a crime or who were poor or essentially didn't have connections. So some of the founders of Harvard Medical School and some early founding fathers, uh, so including Joseph Warren, so he was like a really big figure at like the Battle of Bunker, Bunker Hill, they would actually go and steal human bodies um, from from uh, burial grounds and use them for uh, medical, for their, for their medical education. Um, in 1999, they found some uh, human bones in the walls of Harvard's chapel um, that kind of show like the the physicality of what this was um but also just last year there was a big huge controversy because people uh stole and sold body parts from harvard medical school's morgue um so i don't know about you but if i were a creative writing teacher and someone was like i'm gonna write a story about the founding fathers literally stealing bones to like create like their college and to like create like you know to to fund their education I would be like, that is so on the nose that they, it really, it all writes itself, right? Um, so we have um, the kind of like grimness already in from the beginning. There's also, of course, everyone who thinks about New England often thinks about the Salem witch trials. Um, so these were between 1692 and 1693, around the time that the European witchcraft panic starts to fade away. Um, there are over 200 people accused and 20 executed for witchcraft. So a lot of people actually think that the Salem witch trials took place in present-day Salem. Um, it was actually, most of it took place in Salem Village, which is now Danvers, Massachusetts. Um, there are some things that took place in Salem Town, which is what uh, Salem, Massachusetts is today, um, but a lot of it took place in Danvers. Um, it begins when uh, Reverend Samuel Paris's daughter and niece, Betty and Abigail, have these, their fits. They're like screaming, they're shrieking, they're contorting, they're doing all these things. Um, so Betty Abigail and another girl named Anne Putnam Jr. accused three women of witchcraft. So you have Tichaba, who was an enslaved Caribbean woman. You have Sarah Wood, who was an impoverished beggar. And you have Sarah Osborne, who was a social outcast. After her first husband died, she hired an indentured servant, and then she married that indentured servant. And there was a lot of speculation that she and that indentured servant may have been uh, living in sin prior to getting married. Um, so what we see is there are these people from powerful families, like the daughter and niece of the reverend, accusing people who are already social outcasts, already othered, the community, othered in the community of hurting them. Um, so there's paranoia, there's accusations. So they op the, the um, state opens the courts of Oyer to hear and Terminer to decide. And people go before Oyer and Terminer, 
And the big, big question in the Salem witch trials um, and what actually ended up finally bringing it down is the question of spectral evidence. So spectral evidence is basically you saying you're in court and you're saying, oh, she's a witch because she sent her spirit out in the middle of the night in her in spirit form to like stick pins into like my eyes or whatever. Um, and that would be considered evidence by the court. Now, you may notice that that is not something you can conclusively prove. That's just someone saying something. Um, and the Salem witch trials doesn't actually properly wind down until the courts of Oyer and Terminer are disbanded. Um, governor Phipps, of, who's currently the governor of the, col of the colony, he steps in and he creates a new court that does not accept spectral evidence as evidence. And that's what kind of finally brings it down. So a couple of things we see here. We see that it exacerbates existing rivalries and prejudices inside the community. It shows a demonstrable fear of the other. There's racism, xenophobia, sexism. Um, people essentially like using this mass panic um, as a way to kind of reinforce these social boundaries. We're also going to see that some prominent names in the witch trials are going to gain greater cultural importance in New England. So, for example, the Putnam family um, and Putnam Jr. Well, the Putnams are a Brahmin family. So still kicking, right? Um, and the Hathorns, which we're also going to talk about. I think it's also very interesting that there's a kind of witchcraft tourism in actual Salem today. Um, so, for example, the movie Hocus Pocus. I love Hocus Pocus. I also uh, can understand in my head that Hocus Pocus kind of does make the argument that, like, the Salem witch trials were real and justified. <laughs> um, and that there were real witches. If you go to Salem... Um, I've heard it described as like kind of like the Disneyfication of the witch trials. They call themselves Witch City um, up on the upper right hand corner. That's a screenshot I took of Salem's tourism website of some of the places they can shop. So you see some of the listings include apparel, chocolate and candy, dispensaries, gifts and witch shops and occults. You cannot walk five feet in Salem, Massachusetts without someone threatening to read your aura. And I'm, not, I'm also, I'm not going to lie, I go, I've been to Salem and I enjoy going to the gothy shops and I enjoy looking at like the tarot decks and stuff. Um, but it also like, hey, like that is kind of in a, in a, in a, in a very uh, monetary way profiting off of um, a mass hysteria that killed like a lot of people. Um, so this tension, keep it in mind. Let's see. All right. So we also have New England as being a hotbed for the spiritualist movement. Um, so if you're not familiar with what spiritualism is, it's a transatlantic cultural and religious movement that's largely concerned with communicating with the dead. Uh, in America, it, it's largely traced back to 1848. These two young girls, um, uh, Kate and Margaret Fox, or Kate and Maggie Fox, um, they said that they were communicating with a murdered peddler through Knox in their uh, home in Hydesville, New York. Um, and that kind of spreads all out over the rest of the country. There's like a kind of a parallel movement in England, largely. Um, it's what's interesting about spiritualism is that a lot of people are like, oh, all these like mediums were like fake frauds that were like trying to like, you know, take advantage of people's grief. And while like that is true that there were people who were like that, um, a lot of mediums were 100 percent sincere in what they were doing. It was also very popular. Spiritualism is very popular in social reform movements. So, for example, the suffrage movement, the abolitionist movement to abolish slavery. Um, it kind of allows people who are not often given a voice in society to be able to speak freely. So, for instance, if I'm a medium in 18 whatever and I want women to be able to vote, they might listen to me more if I say that I just had I am speaking with a. Uh, with George Washington, the first president, and he says, no, actually, guys, you should allow women to vote. So it's the idea of social progress from beyond the veil is very interesting. It also says a lot about how Amer American culture kind of deals with the ideas of grief and mourning. So in American culture, but specifically, I think in a lot of this kind of WASP, uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant New England culture, um, people don't talk about negativity, right? Um, so it's very much kind of a return of the repressed. You don't talk about like, oh, how you're in grief, you don't talk about all these like horrible things that are happening. Um, but um, this kind of gives people a way to talk through it and to think through it and to also have some like closure with a lot of their loved ones. Spiritualism in America, specifically all over the world, I believe, um, has always has a resurgence every time that there is a mass casualty or a mass death event. So, for example, the first revival of spiritualism happens during after the American Civil War, which ends in 1865. And the American Civil War was one of the first times in American history that um, 
upper uh, middle class, well to do, um, like white people were sending their sons and their brothers and fathers and cousins away to fight. And then they just didn't come back. Um, it was the bloodiest war for Americans in American history because it's a civil war. So people, Americans were fighting each other, even though one side said they didn't belong to America anymore. It's a whole thing. Um, but um, people being able to like, you know, oh, well, this person is gone and people usually died at home, right? And now they're dying super, super far away. And so it allows people to kind of like, you know, engage with this kind of like, you know, closure that they may not have previously been able to have. Um, so spiritualism in New England manifests in a lot of ways. New England was very well known for having these uh, spiritualist camp meetings, um, which kind of break off from earlier kind of um, the, the, the camp revival um, kind of thing. It's not the right word. Um, but camp revivals where people would get together and they would preach and they would, you know, um, talk about God. Um, so spiritualism kind of like has their own kind of camp revivals. They set up these communities. Um, they are in the woods, enjoying the natural landscape, um, being able to like kind of engage with more of like the natural world as they engage with the supernatural world. Um, now the, the woods and nature, of course, obviously we see over and over again as a, as a Gothic motif. Um, and that's kind of come back again through like this idea of like the outside, um, being outside of the city, but also being outside of the realms of like, you know, life and death. Um, they run very parallel to each other. Boston was also home to a newspaper called the Banner of Light, which is the oldest uh, and the most long lasting, uh, sorry, not the oldest, um, well, they said that were, uh, the longest lasting and extremely influential spiritualist journal. So it was published every week. It was based in Boston. Uh, they published all sorts of things for spiritualism. There were sermons, there were essays, there were book reviews, uh, notices that would tell you where mediums and lectures were. There was something called the message page. Um, the message page was essentially that mediums would channel and whatever messages they got, they would put it on the message page. So you would read the message page in hopes of having a message from one of your loved ones. It was also, Boston was also the home of a studio belonging to a guy named William Mumler. Um, William Mumler was a no, was a definite fraud. Um, so that he did very early Photoshop for this thing called spirit photography, where essentially he would be like, come to my studio, I'll take a photo of you and your loved one's going to show up in the background and you'll see that they were with you. So people absolutely flocked to his studio. Now, what he used was actually a double exposure kind of method. I can't say that I'm super well versed on exactly how early photography worked, um, but there was a little bit of magic involved. But on the left, you're going to see a picture of Mary Todd Lincoln, um, who was the first lady during the Civil War. At the end of the Civil War, the American president, Abraham Lincoln, was assassinated by a man named John Wilkes Booth. Also, tell me if I'm talking too fast. That's also a thing that I do a lot. <laughs> now, um, now she, um, Mary Todd Lincoln was like super into the occult. And she actually had like a White House medium. And after she died, she went to William Mumler's studio and got a photograph taken of herself with the hopes of seeing, as you can see, kind of very faintly in the background, her deceased husband, Abraham Lincoln. Now, there were, of course, plenty of pictures of Abraham Lincoln floating around at this time that could have been used for this. Um, but you can kind of see how people like Mary Todd Lincoln are trying to process um, their grief and their negative emotions. There is also a vampire panic uh, in, in Rhode Island and in New England. Um, so I'm specifically going to be talking about what happened to a young lady named Mercy Lena Brown. She was born in 1872 in Exeter, Rhode Island. Now, Exeter um, was a lot, was very rural, small, and isolated. So a lot of some of the most up-to-date scientific discourse it did not reach them, like, super, super fast. So multiple members of her family die of tuberculosis between 1882 and 1892. Now, um, sometimes tuberculosis kills you quickly. Sometimes it's very, very drawn out. And Mercy Brown had an example of the more drawn out called galloping um, consumption. So she, it took her a while to die, but she finally dies on January 17th, 1892. Now, shortly after she dies, her brother Edmund um, is, becomes very sick um, and looks like he might die of tuberculosis. And um, her father, um, his wife's died, his daughters have died, his son might die too, and he is getting very, very desperate. So people come to him and they say, hey, like, there is a bit of, there's a, a folklore, you might want to try this. If everyone in your family is dying, it's probably that one of your family members is actually, one of your dead family members actually, is actually like a vampire or, or some revenant 
back from the dead, sucking all the energy and life out of out of the people who are still alive. So it takes a while for um for him to decide to like George for George Exeter to decide to finally, you know, go with it. But he is so beset by grief that he's like, okay. They're like, what you need to do is go to see where all your family members were buried. And if one of them like doesn't look super decomposed, then that's probably the vampire. So what you're going to do is you're going to cut out the heart and the liver. You're going to burn it, make the ashes into kind of like, you know, I don't want to say potion, but like medicine and say and serve it to your son, Edwin. And then like that should that should stop the killing. So they go. So he goes in and he sees uh, goes into where everyone's buried and everyone pretty much looks like, you know, skeletons at this point, especially, you know, the mother who's been dead for a decade. But Mercy Brown she is looking all right. Now, the doctor says that, you know, she's decomposing naturally, but she doesn't actually look super decomposed. Um, she's also got blood in her heart and liver. And they're like, oh, well, obviously, Mercy must be the vampire. So they cut out her heart, they cut out her liver, they give it to Edwin. And about two months later, Edwin dies anyway, because she wasn't a vampire. Um, now, what we understand, and what I believe the doctor understood, is that Mercy Brown died in January. Um, New England in January is cold. So Mercy Brown wasn't super decomposed because she she was essentially in a freezer. Um, she was very well preserved, which is a lot, a lot of um, ideas of vampirism often spread from um, misconceptions about how decomposition actually works. Um, but there is a belief. Um, I don't believe that he's ever particularly written this down, but it is very commonly thought or attributed that the character of Lucy Westenra in Dracula is based off of what happened to Mercy Brown. So you do see a kind kind of um, similarities. Tuberculosis, for example, the process of dying of tuberculosis, especially the slow galloping kind, um, very much is very similar to how Lucy um, slowly succumbs to vampirism. Um, the kind of, you know, quiet fading away. Um, they cut off her head. They take out her heart. Um, it's very interesting that um, the surgeon, uh, the doctor, Seward, um, also expresses skepticism the same way the doctor over Mercy expresses skepticism. Um, but it's it's a definitely an interesting connection to make. Um, I've, I've seen tuberculosis described as heroin chic for the 19th century. Um, and I think there's definitely some uh, merit to that idea. Um, but so you see the already the influence of folklore, um, even if not on purpose, the uncanny resemblance of folklore to the fiction that people are creating. There's also a place in New England called the Bridgewater Triangle, um, which is kind of America, uh, uh, the weird paranormal part of the country or of the region. Um, but it's connected also to back to King Philip's War. Um, so this is where Chief Metacomet was killed during King Philip's War, specifically in this uh, swamp, the Hockamock Swamp. Um, and around the swamp, people have seen Bigfoot, ghosts, orbs, UFOs, cattle mutilation. There is a uh, rock with these mysterious glyphs on it. Um, there's this like weird stone. I, I actually, when I was in college, uh, when I was like a junior, um, they hold a UFO convention in, in the, uh, Bridgewater Triangle every year. So I went for one day cause it was $25. Um, and I wanted to see what it was like. And yeah, I was in this town called Lemonster and there were people with like, with like a Bigfoot, like print casting and, um, like a, a guy who had written about like, um, black eyed kids and like men in black. And there was a, a support group for people who had been abducted by UFOs and people were giving presentations on like the way that like, oh, like these different universes bubble off from each other. And like, this is what alien abductions are like, um, which I, I think is interesting, not just the relationship back to the fact that this is a site of immense trauma for the, um, for indigenous people, um, but also the fact that, that kind of trauma has almost like con is considered separate from what actually happened to them um, or is not kind of part of what they experience today, um, which when we get to Stephen King, we're going to talk about that. But um, it's kind of on the on the Bridgewater Triangle. But here we go. All right. We're going to talk about literature now. Um, actually, um, do you just, Sam, do you think it would make sense to like have some like quick questions or should I just keep going? All right. Um, so. We're going to talk about literature, um, specifically about the idea of hauntology. So if you're not familiar with hauntology, 
Hauntology is kind of the eruption of the past into the present, first written about um, by Jacques Derrida, Inspectors of Marx, but it's kind of largely uh, expanded to encompass like anything where the absence of the past in the present feels very like relevant. I like describing it as the presence of absence. Um, there are a whole bunch of different ways to talk about it. It's it's gotten quite broad. So New England literature is I think, extremely hauntological because it has that really unique engagement in history that a lot of other parts of the United States post-colonization don't really have. So you see here, John Hathorne, who is one of the hanging judges at the Salem Witch Trials, his great-great-grandson is Nathaniel Hawthorne. Nathaniel Hawthorne changed his name from Hathorne to Hawthorne because he did not want to be associated with his great-great-grandfather. Um, so the past ha haunt in the present all the time, all over the place. So here are some pictures from Boston, right? So above, you're going to see King's Chapel Burying Ground. That was a picture taken in 1929. Um, King's Chapel Burying Ground is the oldest burial ground in Boston. It is um, it was, uh, it was first created in 1630. Um, that picture is actually quite similar to what that part of the city looks like today. So you see literally just across the street, you've got all these little Puritan headstones. And then right over here, you've got like a, a building, commerce, people doing stuff. If you actually were standing in this exact same position and just turned a little bit to the left and looked up, you would see the skyscrapers of the financial district. I remember the first time that I saw this burial ground, I was caught so off guard because I was like, I'm walking through a modern city with skyscrapers and suddenly everything levels out and there are all these old headstones. Um, there's also, this is where the Winthrop family is buried. Uh, so John Winthrop, I uh, wait still Winthrop, all of a lot of those descendants, the last one, um, actually, I believe it says 1920. So from like the 1600s to the 20th century, people are being buried here for the Winthrop family. Um, so like the guy who like founded Mass Bay is like smack dab in the middle of the city in this fairly unassuming little tomb. Right there, um, you see the Granary Burying Ground, which is literally just down the street from King's Chapel Burying Ground. Um, that is a picture from around today, and to the right is a, is a print from 1873. You see they still look very, very similar. The Granary Burying Ground is a burying ground that is full of some of the most important figures from the Revolutionary War. So uh, uh, Samuel Adams is buried here, James Otis is buried here, John Hancock is buried here, Paul Revere is buried here, and you wouldn't be shocked to know that both that burying ground and King's Chapel Burying Ground are widely believed to be very haunted. Um, people constantly report orbs in the burying ground, um, but also kind of shadow figures are a very common one. Uh, a couple of my friends from the ghost tour have actually said that they saw the same woman hanging from a tree in the Granary Burying Ground. Now, I spent a lot of nights in the Granary Burying Ground and in King's Chapel Burying Ground, and I didn't see anything. But sometimes I'm just like, I don't know, maybe the ghost didn't think I was down to hang. But there are smaller, more subtle ways that this uh, history is present in modern day New England. So a picture on the right, now that is a Chipotle. That is a fast food restaurant that makes Mexican food. Um, it's good, it's cheap, it only sometimes has E. coli in it. But that uh, Chipotle occupies a building that used to be called the Old Corner Bookstore. And there is a little placard on the side of that Chipotle that says, historic monument. This was the Old Corner Bookstore. It's a very old, uh, important uh, bookstore in Boston history. But what a lot of people don't know is that if you go just up the street from that Chipotle, there is a library called the Boston Athenaeum, which is the oldest private library in the country. And inside of the Boston Athenaeum, there is a book called The Highwayman, which is written by a man named James uh, James Allen. Um, he went by a couple of names, um, Walton being one of them. So ik liber waltonis cute compactus a est. My Latin sucks. Um, but he was a, uh, a highwayman and a robber. And um, after he was finally caught and went to prison, he said when he died, he wanted his memoir. So this is his memoir right here on the left, um, bound in his own flesh. Um, so he had skin taken off of his back, I think. He had his memoir bound in it. He had it actually sent to the guy who was responsible for turning him in, um, which I think is hilarious and like so petty. Um, and that book is currently in the Boston Athenaeum, but it was bound at this Chipotle, at this Chipotle right here. And every time I walked by it, I'm like, the skin book Chipotle. Oh my God, people are eating in there and they don't know. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that like is just there and people don't know about. Um, for example, the uh, Boston subway. So Boston subway system is called the MBTA, the Mass Bay Transit Authority. People just call it the T. It's the oldest subway system in the entirety of America, in the United States. 
Um, and the first line of the T was built uh, in 1896, opened 1897, um, going from Park Street at one end of the Boston Common to Boylston Street, which is the other end. So the Boston Common is just this huge public park. Um, it's actually the oldest kind of public green space uh, in America as well. Um, so when they were digging that tunnel in the late 19th century to build that first subway line, they find a mass grave of British soldiers. Um, they find human remains that were buried in that same location. Now those human remains are exhumed and buried in the central burying ground, which is kind of at like a further corner of the common. Um, but yeah, people say that place is haunted as well because of because of uh, all the human remains they found. In fact, the Boston Common itself is a massive potter's field. So not just these British soldiers, but a lot of unmarked graves are on the Boston Common. A lot of dead people are buried there. Um, so you go there on like, again, like a Friday night, people are like, you know, smoking, drinking, laughing above a, huge bun a whole bunch of skeletons. So we're going to see, we see some recurring themes both in the stuff we discussed already and what we are going to talk about um, when I when we get to literature, which is what's next. Um, so we have creepy wasps. So if you don't know, that stands for white Anglo-Saxon Protestant and most Boston Brahmins and most upper crusty uh, American aristocrats are wasps. We have uh, monsters, the uh, people being the monsters, uh, the monster monstrosity of humanity. Um, we have insidious architecture, which, we'll, which I'll elaborate more on when we get to it. We have, I think, above all things, the yawning maw of history ready to swallow up anyone who looks into it and the idea of what it means to be the other. And that's a screenshot from Over the Garden Wall, which I think is a great series, but that also kind of really touches on some of these kind of like New England Gothic themes. So some famous New England authors. Um, the ones with an asterisk are the ones that we're going to talk about. Um, but we have H.P. Lovecraft, Stephen King, Shirley Jackson. Edgar Allan Poe is associated more with Baltimore, but he was actually born in Boston. Kelly Link is a contemporary writer. I love her. She's amazing. If you haven't read Kelly Link, please do that right now. Um, but she's based out in Western Massachusetts. But we're going to start with H.P. Lovecraft. So he was born in Providence, Rhode Island in 1890. He created the Cthulhu Mythos, which is kind of just his overarching like cosmology of gods and monsters and, and creatures and stuff. Uh, very influential in the development of cosmic horror, um, which is the idea that how do you deal with the fact that you are but a tiny speck in an uncaring universe? Uh, he's best known for writing capital W weird fiction about New England and also being really, 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 really racist, like to the point where like, Italian is too ethnic for him. Um, and that's going to be really important when we talk about the actual stuff he's written. So his writing, like I said, is really, really related to the folklore and the history of New England. So if you see right here, this bit from Pickman's Model, um, Pickman's Model is a story about a guy who goes in these tunnels underneath the north end of Boston. Um, and there are these kind of like ghoul monsters that live there and um, Pickman is painting them. They're his, they're his model, his model for his paintings. Um, he just creates these incredibly unnerving paintings of these creatures. Um, the narrator of the story talks about how um, these models, oh, not these models, these tunnels are beneath, um, there weren't three houses in sight that hadn't been standing in Cotton Mather's time. Cotton Mather being one of those original Puritan ministers. Uh, later in the case of Charles Dexter's, Dexter Ward, which we're gonna elaborate on in a bit, um, a character who is a necromancer um, the case of Charles Dexter's Ward is about a bunch of necromancers who are uh, reanimating themselves uh, to live like these super long lives and reanimating their buds and reanimating other people to get uh, dirt they can use against uh, people to keep their mouths shut. Um, now, one of the necromancers will writing to um, the villain of the story. Um, he says, I wouldn't I would have you observe what was told to us about taking care whom to call up for you are sensible what Mr. Matt other wrote in Ye Magnalia of um, yeah, I was, of course, talking about Magnalia Christi Americana, written by Cotton Mather in 1702. This uh, uh, novella was written in 1927. So the villain of the case of Charles Dexter Ward is a guy named Joseph Kerwin. He is like the top necromancer. Um, and I think it's really interesting. We talk about like where did Joseph Kerwin come from? He writes, his birth was known to be good since the Kerwins or Corwins of Salem needed no introduction in New England. So it's it really heavily implied that he had a relationship to Jonathan Corbin, one of the Salem Witch Trials judges, um, who was responsible for a lot of deaths. 
And I think that is very interesting, kind of held in tension with the racism in this story. Um, so, uh, so uh, uh, Joseph Kerwin, um, the people who are often like helping him out with his like nefarious deeds, um, they're Native American, they're African American, um, they are 100% certainly not white people. And you see this again and again in Lovecraft's fiction, that the kind of attendants of the monstrous are always are often based on some kind of racial or ethnic other. And that tension, I think, is very clear in Charles Dexter, or this particular tension in Charles Dexter Ward, because I can tell you, as an American, um, when I read a story about a necromancer who is constantly reanimating himself from an old, powerful family to maintain that power, I think about how everyone in Congress is like a million years old and will never retire and will die before they have to deal with the effects of global warming or like, you know, the singularity. And I'm like, yeah, I can 100% see like, yeah, that's that that checks out to me. Powerful old man reanimating himself to hold on to power and hold on to influence, check. But him being kind of like an ally of those who are othered um, and those who are othered being kind of his attendants and and his enablers, like that is those are those are the people who are getting hurt by by people who are constantly like refusing to let go of power. Um, so there's a, a video essay that I, I watched quite some time ago. Um, I think it was by H. Bomber guy, actually, um, but it really sat, sat with me that what's really interesting when reading Lovecraft is that he does really cosmic horror um, and H.P. Lovecraft does actually a decent job of capturing the feeling of being an outsider, of of being othered, of being on the margins. He just takes it from a the opposite direction. He like flip flops it. It's the the um, those who already have power often being like uh, threatened by the outside. Um, and I don't know if anyone's read. There's this great uh, novella by Victor Laval called The Ballad of Black Tom, um, which is a kind of reimagining of Lovecraft's story, the horror at Red Hook, um, which is a pretty, I mean, they're all racist stories, but a pretty racist story uh, by Lovecraft standards as well. Reimagining it with a Black protagonist. Um, and in this case, the protagonist finds himself allying with um, these cosmic entities because um, it's not as bad as the overarching uh, threat that one is powerless under systems of white supremacy. Um, so I think that's a, a reason why Lovecraft continues to be reinterpreted and rewritten um, and revisited um, because there, there are some interesting ideas here. Um, he just, you know, doesn't stick the landing for because of his prejudices and um, his general racism, anti-Semitism, all that jazz. Um, also remember the Harvard Spunker Club and um, all these people, I forgot to tell you what they were called. They were called resurrection men. Um, and that was a that was a transatlantic thing um, that people would go dig up body parts uh, or dig up dead bodies. Um, there's a, a Robert Louis Stevenson story um, that uh, about it in Scotland, I believe. Um, but in Charles Dexter Ward, Joseph Kerwin, they're like, wow, this guy is always hanging out at graveyards. That's weird. I wonder why that's happening. Um, and so you see the idea of the resurrection man and the idea of like the past being literally dug up and reanimated for um, for Lovecraft's made literalized for Lovecraft's purposes of, again, reinforcing these boundaries. Lovecraft also, because he was so uh, unbelievably racist, um, so he was a strong su subscriber to the idea of degeneration. So you see degeneration narratives popping up starting in the mid 19th century when uh, Charles Darwin's philosophy or Charles Darwin's theories start to gain pop culture prominence. Now, evolution, the theory of evolution, um, if you actually like understand how it works, evolution does not have goals. Like evolution is just whatever randomly, like whatever mutations that are randomly acquired, just like how they move forward, well, it works, whatever. But what a lot of people thought or a lot of kind of like, you know, misinterpretations were that, oh, if we evolved from like apes, then we could devolve. So the idea of degeneration is that like up on the top, you got like white people and then you get slowly darker in skin tone until you get to actual monkeys. Um, racist, obviously, super, super racist. Um, and um, this is how we get things like uh, the eugenics movement. Um, you see in the 19th century, um, there's um, social Darwinism, the idea that, you know, specifically, you know, the, uh, you know, 
white, often British, um, they say, oh, this is evolution. We're the most evolved. Um, and that's why we can kill everyone else because we evolved the most um, and we're higher up on the chain. But of course, then they feel super anxious about the idea of like, oh, what happens if you go down the chain? Because we think we can go down the chain. We think we can devolve. We think we, think we can degenerate. Um, so in the uh, Shadow Over Innsmouth, um, now that's a story that um, is a super obvious metaphor for fears and misogynation of, of, uh, of racial mixing. So it's about a guy who goes to this uh, Massachusetts town called Innsmouth where everyone is creepy and weird and they smell gross and they look weird. Um, the older ones always look weirder and grosser than the younger ones. Um, when this man is about to go to uh, Innsmouth, he's taking a bus through there because uh, it was a cheap bus ride. Um, but the guy who's selling him the ticket says that um, the plague of 1946 must have taken off the best blood in the place. Innsmouth used to be good, but the best blood has has gone now as we find out there was no actual plague what happened is that the people in Innsmouth um or this one particular man in Innsmouth kind of started a cult where uh they started um having sexual relationships with these uh fish people called the deep ones um having human uh deep one hybrid offspring and those are the people who live in Innsmouth who as they get older get more and more fish like until they go into the ocean to be full-time deep ones so as our narrator is going in towards uh, Innsmouth, he describes the landscape being the vast huddle of sagging gambrel roofs and peaked gables conveyed with offensive clearness the idea of wormy decay. And as we approached along the now descending road, I could see that many roofs had wholly caved in. So we have, you see this obvious parallel um, between the idea of, of physical, like human degeneration, and the fact that this city is, or this town is literally falling apart. Um, so... We also have our narrator, who at the end, the plot twist is that it turns out he finds out he's partially deep one um, and decides to join up with them, which like personally, a deep, being a deep one sounds great. You like live underwater and you can, can't die unless being killed. I don't I don't know if they got rent underwater. They got lots of money and it sounds great for them. Um, so shout out to the narrator. But in Lovecraft's original notes, um, this narrator is actually referred to as a guy named Robert Olmsted. Now, he's never named in the story, but in his notes, he calls him Robert Olmsted. And there's a landscape architect um, in New England called, um, uh, I'm blanking on his first name, but his name is also Olmsted, Olmsted spelled differently, and um, who's responsible for creating a lot of the really big public landscapes, uh, public parks. So the public garden in Boston, the Emerald Necklace in Boston, if you are a Bostonian, you know what I'm talking about, um, were all designed by this man. Um, so it's like, oh, like we have this guy who is a representative of like a designer of like, you know, the beautiful and and the like well-maintained kind of essentially degenerating into this town. It's also very interesting that the name Olmstead comes from his mother's side. Uh, sorry, his father's side. His mother's side is the deep one. His father's side is Olmstead. Um, so you see again, like, oh, like the fear of race mixing. His Olmstead father's side has been degenerated by his mother's side. Um, I also will say that I didn't find any specific evidence linking uh, Lovecraft to saying, oh, yeah, I'm naming him after Olmsted. But the timelines line up. There is literally no way that H.P. Lovecraft would not have known who Olmsted was. Um, so this is just my personal pet theory. Um, you can you are free to uh, take it or say there is not enough evidence, which is fine. Um, I just thought it was a very interesting coincidence and a little too interesting to be ignored. So in Stephen King's It, as um, as Bill um, Denbro is heading back to his hometown of Derry, he's going through Boston. There are a few people in the streets he's passing, and a pedestrian or two on the walkways or the overpass. They give lie to the impression that he has somehow wandered into a Lovecrafty tale of doomed cities, ancient evils, and monsters with unpronounceable names. Here, ganged around a bus stop with a sign reading Kenmore Square City Center, he sees waitresses, nurses, city employees, their faces naked and puffed with sleep. And the reason that I have this quote is because it's a segue. We're going to talk about Stephen King. Um, and we're going to talk about, uh, first, his book, It, which features a 100% cosmic horror creature um, known as Pennywise, but also it doesn't really have a name. It's from, like, the macroverse that projects itself into, like, the micro... There's a turtle. It's a whole thing. There's a whole cosmology. Um, but this is kind of his cosmic eldritch monster. So, first, who's Stephen King? 
we kind of all know who Stephen King is, but just to, you know, to clarify um, just the specific details. So he was born in 1947 in Portland in Maine. So I think I may mention Maine was originally part of Massachusetts. Um, he moved around for a good chunk of his childhood, returns to Maine at age 11. His first novel, Carrie, is sold in 1973. He has written over 50 books. I swear to God, he releases a new book every week. Uh, many of them are horror, and a lot of those horror stories specifically are set in the New England area. So Stephen King's kind of deal, his like whole shtick, um, is that the humans are the monsters for the most part. Um, a lot of his, uh, a lot of his monsters exist at that kind of intersection between the monstrous and the human. So to start with it specifically, um, so it takes place in a town called Derry in Maine. Derry is not a real town, town, but it is based off of Bangor, um, which is where Stephen King is living. And he writes it um, and bases a lot of things that happen in it um, or places and things on real stuff from Bangor. So, for example, that Paul Bunyan statue on the right, um, at one point in it, uh, Richie Tozier uh, encounters this monstrous uh, Paul Bunyan statue. Um, that's a real thing in in there in, in Bangor. <laughs> See, I'm confusing them. Um, but in it specifically. And I, I mean, obviously, in a lot of Stephen King books, but in it. Um, that book really captures um, the banality of human evil, which is very interesting considering the fact that it's effectively, that it's in many ways a cosmic horror story. Um, at one point, uh, it's described, Derry hasn't died. On the contrary, it's thrived in an unspectacular, unnewsworthy way, of course. It was simply a fairly prosperous small city in a relatively unpopular state where bad things happen too often and where ferocious things happen every quarter of a century or so. So, for those have, who have not read it or watched the movie or the miniseries or anything, essentially it, the monster it, like reemerges from like a hibernation every 27 years and feeds on by and large children. The reason why is because it describes fear as salting the meat. Um, kids have more concrete fears. So that means it's able to shape into something that will scare them more. Whereas adults are afraid of things like like confrontation and emails and like the specter of mortality which isn't really a like thing that you can become so it kill it 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 preys on all these kids it goes back to sleep 27 years later those kids are now adults and it's their kids who are now being preyed on and it's really prominent in the story that adults it's an untreated cancer the adults really don't pay attention now, it's implied that that is kind of part of the psychological manipulation of it, um, but also in many ways they've just accepted this kind of route violence as part of what their lives are simply like. Now, um, it, every time it is awoken, it's awoken by some act of human violence. So it does not wake up without someone doing something horrible. Uh, the 80s cycle that in the book so what happens it kind of switches between the kids facing it as children in the 50s and then them trying to face it again as adults in the 1980s the 80s killing cycle is awoken by a man named adrian mellon um who is uh killed in a homophobic hate crime um essentially killed tossed over into the river and uh preyed on and feasted on by it which is based on a real murder that happened in bangor maine of a young man named Charlie Howard, whose uh, death was very similar to the way Adrian Mellon's uh, death is in It. Uh, Stephen King even says so. At the time I started writing It, the Howard murder had just happened. It was fresh in my mind and fitted my idea of Derry as a place where terrible things happened. And maybe, needless to say, I was outraged. It was a hate crime. Um, the actual kids who end up fighting It um, are all also kids who have felt marginalized in Derry. Um, so they call themselves the Losers Club because no one wants to be around them because in a large part of their social and just cultural marginalization. Um, you have Mike Hanlon, who is the only um, black kid in Derry. Um, you have Stanley Urris, who is uh, Urris or Urris, I'm not sure, um, who is uh, Jewish. Um, you have Eddie Kasprak, um, who is a hypochondriac, who has a bit of Munchausen's by proxy with his, an abusive relationship with his mother um, or a, a, an abusive relationship from his mother. Um, you have Beverly um, she is uh, suffering from sexual abuse from her father and, and kind of marginalization at school because of it. Um, you have uh, Bill Denbrough, um, who has a stutter, um, and you have um, uh, Ben Hanscom. Uh, he is uh, bullied for his weight. 
um, I think, oh yeah, and Richie Tozier, um, he has glasses, and he's also just kind of like an insecure kind of class clown type. Uh, in the most recent movie, uh, they kind of made it so that he secretly had a crush on Eddie the whole time, but I, I don't believe that's in the book. Um, but the point is that they are outcasts. These kids are outcasts, um, and they are uniquely thus equipped to fight it because they understand the trauma of the town in a very personal way. So it then lives the juncture between past and present. It is almost a manifestation of Derry's prejudice um, and violence. Um, it comes down since the beginning of time. It goes into the sewers. Um, it sleeps. It waits. Um, it's ready to wake up and kill. Um, and I think the fact that it living in the sewers is really, really interesting, obviously, from like a return of the repressed, like, um, psychological reading of the story, the sewers being, of course, the dark undergrowth of the city. Um, so one could say the repressed trauma comes right back up and and starts to target people. Um, but also, it's nothing Stephen King loves more than uh, a story ending with lots of stuff blowing up. Um, it happens so many times in his books. Um, so after the Losers Club, at the end of it, when they're adults, when they theoretically do take down it, however, it does have some eggs, so, um, these parts of the city actually do start to blow up, like, things bust, they break, the city infrastructure is destroyed as it is destroyed, which suggests that it is dairy, like, it, it's, it is a symbiotic relationship, the two of them, um, it had created a place in its own image, and it looked upon this place with favor from the dead lights which were its eyes. Derry was its killing pen, the people of Derry its sheep. Things had gone on. Um, so you see this kind of idea of um, um, the, the people enabling violence when we talk about uh, his vampires in Salem's Lot. Um, Salem's Lot is a kind of sad, lonely town where people are petty and want to leave. Um, and a man named Kurt Barlow, a vampire named Kurt Barlow and his familiar Straker, they come to Salem's Lot with the intention of turning everyone into vampires uh, and kind of creating a new little vampire coven. Now, uh, Straker and Barlow do not survive the story, but they do succeed in actually turning the people in Salem's Lot into vampires. And there's a really interesting kind of narrative structure that happens in Salem's Lot where you kind of switch from like to the narrative, the like action of like what's immediately being done in the story to kind of be like an overview of um of like what's going on in all the different houses and all the city. If anyone's ever uh, watched the seen the play Our Town, I think um it kind of has like a very similar thing. Like oh here's what's happening in in Mabel's house, and here's what's happening in Gwyneth's house, and here's what's happening in Ben's house. Um so kind of like the switch from a small perspective to a broader perspective, and um as more and more people become like vampirized right um like the town still moves on they it's still kind of like a sad dead little place but as one person suggests they probably like being vampires it's not alive um the town's dead like him uh the town almost uh knew as if the evil was coming and shapes and the shapes it would take and afterwards like all the vampires are just living there not much different than they were before and of course, uh, we really can't talk about Stephen King without talking about the fact that he has exploited uh, the ancient Indian burial ground trope. Um, now that's something that comes up a lot in American fiction, but I actually want to talk about it uh, in great more in the context of greater kind of fiction of empire, because I see it as being a kind of update on uh, what's called the invasion narrative. So if you read, uh, if you're familiar with like a lot of kind of popular literature from 19th century Britain, um, you're gonna see this narrative pop up a lot. The idea of someone from the outside of the empire or from the far reaches of the empire coming to the imperial core um, and kind of, you know, wreaking havoc on the people there. So I have a quote on the left um, from a book called Bears the Egyptian by Guy Boothby. So this is kind of one of those mummies curse type things um, where this uh, guy, Pharos, uh, who's, um, uh, Tommy's son of uh, Naturuhotep, prophet of the north and the south, the same whom Pharaoh sought to kill, who died in hiding. I tell thee assuredly that the plague which is now destroying Europe was decreed by the gods of Egypt against such nations as have committed the sin of sacrilege. And you see the invasion narrative showing up, I think, very much as uh, a manifestation of cultural guilt. Um, I think there are, it's, it's more complicated than that, obviously. Um, and the fact that this kind of shows up again and again and again in fiction 
from people of a variety of kind of political views um, definitely means it demands more interrogation. Um, but I see it very similar in a lot of like it way it exists, specifically in American fiction, um, because it's it's the the you just respected the dead, the ghosts of the dead coming back. Um, in Pet Cemetery, the uh, burial ground is a Micmac burial ground, um, and eventually the the Micmac group leaves. Uh, now the actual Micmac people do not have such a thing in their uh, you know uh, cultural or, or religious. Um, theology or I'm blanking on the right word but you know what I'm saying um but it was exploited uh by Stephen King to kind of tell this story you'll notice also that a lot of Indian burial ground tropes don't actually have a lot of Native Americans in the story um so Pet Cemetery, I think another one would be um uh, Poltergeist uh the uh movie um but again you kind of see these kind of like you know happy suburban Americans or happy kind of rural Americans um coming and just getting like destroyed uh by the 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 sins of the country um so it's um it's simultaneously very offensive to actual indigenous people and revealing about the way that a lot of americans uh, who are not indigenous kind of deal with the less or more uh, blatantly genocidal parts of american history now finally um i want to talk about shirley jackson um so shirley jackson wasn't initially from New England. She was born in California, in Northern California, just outside of San Francisco. She moves to Rochester, New York at age 14. While she is studying at Syracuse University, she meets her future husband, Stanley Edgar Hyman. They move to New York City, and then they go to uh, North Bennington, Vermont. Now, Stanley teaches at Bennington College, and uh, Shirley Jackson stays there for the most part. There was a couple years where she lived elsewhere, but she stays there for the most part until she dies in her sleep in 1965. Now, I'm going to be uh, quoting a lot from uh, Dr. Bernice Murphy, um, who is, I just admire her so much. She's very nice, but she's also just like the Shirley Jackson person. Um, and she has this great essay that I highly recommend reading, um, like about like Shirley Jackson and the New England Gothic. Um, but in Shirley Jackson's fiction, I have her in my notes. I describe her as like Lovecraft's Wario, um, because you almost see her story kind of talking about the idea of outsiderness from the opposite side, from like the idea of being the outsider. Um, so, for example, her book Hangs a Man um, was based on her um, on when she was living near Bennington College, right? So she talks about um, the college that her protagonist, Natalie Waite, goes to. It's based on Bennington, right? So thus, the college was, in brief, a place modern, authentic, progressive, realistic, honest, and humane, with decent concessions to the fact that it was supposed to be, and had to be, a strictly budget-balanced proposition, a factory in which the intake must necessarily match the outgo. So you see, again, that tension between, like, the idea of, like, you know, New England as this cool, great, progressive place where, like, you know, people are smart, and people are well-informed and people are, you know, classy and great, but kind of like the reality of it. So the colleges uh, describes that, um, uh, like a couple of pages before this, they're like, oh, like we're going to have the original beams. Um, it's going to be like, you know, it's going to be held up uh, by these like, you know, beautiful structures and it's going to be a beautiful college. And like, maybe we, uh, we don't even need to like have grades maybe. Um, if um, I'm correct, I reread this yesterday, but I have to uh, one of the kind of Lucy things they decided to do and then uh, decided they didn't want to do it anyway. Um, but she notes that the original beams that the original founders wanted to have in the college were have been found to need constant repair. Plastic brick had been substituted whenever possible. So I also think about that in like contrast with in the shadow over Innsmouth. Um, the city itself is rotting and in Innsmouth, it is suggested that it is rotting because of the people who have come to it. And Shirley Jackson, the college is needs constant repair because of the actual foundation and the actual things that it was built with. Um, so Shirley Jackson's fiction, as uh, Dr. Murphy writes, uh, clashes, takes clashes between the newcomers or outsiders, um, uh, kind of um, violating these codes of behavior etiquette, these kind of like, you know, social codes that people like the Puritans, the Brahmins, um, and all of their descendants kind of forged for New England. Um, so there's a picture of Bennington College. Um, but like I said, modeled on Bennington. Um, and uh, Dr. Murphy makes a really great point that um, there's a big contrast between kind of the woods outside where kind of Natalie goes to regain her sanity. Um, or, or like essentially has this showdown with who this person who may or may not be her imaginary friend, Tony, um, in the woods, um, which is also contrasted earlier on with the sexual assault that she experiences in the woods, um, by her house. 
Um, so like, yes, like the college is like scary, but so is like being lost from the college. Um, so is just the landscape and the people who create it and what you might become like in the midst of it. So for example, if anyone's read the, uh, the lottery, um, very famous Shirley Jackson story when it was published in the New Yorker, a whole bunch of people wrote in to cancel their subscriptions, um, because it was so, um, so absolutely like, they were like, this is horrible. But if you haven't read the lottery, it is about a small town of people where once a year they hold the lottery and whoever <laughs> wins the lottery, uh, gets stoned to death and they don't know why they do it. It's just what's done. Um, and in the lottery, um, in her story, the woman who gets caught this year or who gets, who wins this year is a woman named Tessie Hutchinson. Um, as Faye Ringle writes, um, while they never indicate, well, she never says it's actually in New England. Um, people believe it's in New England um, because of the char the names, the characters, their willingness to follow old customs, even when they no longer understand why, and their ability to slaughter innocent scapegoats, scape uh, scapegoats and then return to daily life as though nothing had happened. So uh, Tessie Hutchinson say shares a name with a woman named Anne Hutchinson, who was a Puritan uh, dissenter uh, who uh, had to leave uh, the colony. She essentially argued that um, the Puritan church um, did was not accepting the idea of the covenant of grace so they were like it's like hard to describe especially um if you hadn't like been raised puritan um and it took me a while when i was reading it to be like wait what does she mean but she essentially was saying that the church was focusing too much on the covenant of works of like doing to be of, of doing things to be saved and as we know as puritans there are no co there's no covenant of works anymore so they weren't talking about the covenant of grace so she wanted people to think more kind of like, you know, about, you know, intuitive, like, are you like one with God? Um, and and she is killed. Uh, sorry, uh, Tessie Hutchinson is killed just as Anne Hutchinson is expelled from the inside to the outside. So being an outsider, being an outsider in this place where you feel like you are not welcome. And of course, uh, we can't talk about uh, Shirley Jackson without talking about The Haunting of Hill House, um, the the wonderful, wonderful book. Um, where, uh, in, if I know, um, there's a mini series and there's a book I've watched, I watched the mini series. I liked it, but I also consider it as a whole different thing from the book because it's such like not an actual adaptation. Um, but Hill House is like the ultimate kind of like uncanny house. And so are like a lot of her, you know, old mansions that she writes about. So like in, um, uh, the sundial, uh, we have always lived in the castle. We've got these old Victorian manors, um, that kind of are these, uh, I was about to say firmament, that's not the right word, um, but are kind of the, like, these bases for, like, you know, New England, New Englander power, or, like, old money power, think Brahmins, think Newport, that sort of thing, um, and I wrote Hugh Cram, that when old Hugh, Hugh Crane expected that someday Hill House might become a show place, like the Winchester House in California, or many, the many octagon houses, he designed Hill House himself, remember, and I have told you before, he was a strange man, every angle is slightly wrong, um, so again, it's that idea of the uncanny, right? There's like, it's supposed to be like, you know, this, this wonderful house, this kind of manifestation of like, you know, New England wealth and power, but there's something a little bit off with it. Um, now in the haunting of Hill House in the actual book, a bunch of people who had experienced paranormal things over the course of their life are in invited to Hill House, um, by a man, Dr. Montague to essentially do a paranormal experiment. And one of the people who are invited is this woman named Eleanor Vance. Um, who is dealing with a great deal of anxiety and trauma and essentially just a lack of, you know, selfhood because she has spent most of her life caring for her sick mother. Um, and this is essentially, she's in her early 30s and this is the first time she has um, been able to do anything from her for herself. And so she has a hard time, like, imagining herself as an independent person, right? So she is terrified of being an outsider. So, for instance, um, when they find that someone or something in the house has written, like, come home, Eleanor, um, she says, why me? I'm outside, she thought madly. I am the one chosen. So she desperately wants to be friends with the people here. She desperately wants to form these relationships. But what the house does, um, which is, which is uh, foreshadowed when Hugh Crane's wife has died before she even gets into the house, her carriage overturning, is she essentially... Maybe there are ghosts, maybe there aren't. Shirley Jackson likes to leave it, have it very kind of like ambiguous. Um, but she essentially 
like melds with the house itself. Um, so she is so afraid of being an outsider and so desperate for, you know, emotion for having emotional relationships with people and so desperate to feel wanted and need and seen and understood that um the house and all of its horrible history almost swallows her whole. She thought she dies when she commits suicide um by driving her car into a tree as she's leaving. Um so just to wrap up, um New England, big state of history or, or uh, big big region of history, the the hauntology of history um and the fact that you know it has that kind of you know spectral gothic quality or spectral weird quality that constantly has it's uh the people who read it read about it and who think about it um dealing with um the ghosts of what was in the past um so thank you so much um i don't know how long that took um <laughs> But um, just if uh, my email, if you have questions beyond this conversation, or if you want to get in touch with me, my email is snmich96 at gmail.com. And my website is sarahmichelsoncreative.com. And yeah, that was fun. <laughs>